Good morning and welcome to the Career and Technical Education Counselor Academy. We have a great program planned for you today, but I'd like to just go through some housekeeping items as we get started. My name is Amy Julian. I'm the director for the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support at Illinois State University. And all attendees are currently in listen only mode. So you are currently muted. We do want to hear from you. And if you do have any questions or comments, we invite you to raise your hand or post those questions in the question box. And we will be stopping periodically through the webinar to address those questions. Your presenters today are Heather Strom from the Illinois State Board of Education and myself, Amy Hello. Julian from the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional, oh yes. Hello. From ICSPS. <laughs> Heather, would you like to say a good morning? Good morning, everyone. Thank you. So again, this webinar is gonna be recorded. If you have um, would like to share it or watch it later, that will be sent out to everyone once we get that posted. And um, if you have any questions, go ahead and post those as we go or raise your hand. We'd like this to be as interactive as possible. So our agenda for the morning, we're going to do welcome and introduction. We're gonna cover what CTE is and why CTE is important. We are also going to cover what my role is as a counselor in career and technical education. And then as we all know, Perkins 5 has been reauthorized and what is the impact for Perkins 5 and CTEI? As I said in the introduction, the CTE Counseling, Counselor Academy is really why we're all here. And we have put together a very exciting agenda for you. This year we are focusing on Perkins 5 and implementing Perkins 5 and really what that means to counselors as stakeholders, as engaged partners, and how we're going to move forward. So what we have put together for you is today an overview of CTE and Perkins, which is our webinar today. On December 2nd, we invite you all to attend the NTO Summit, so Non-Traditional Occupations Summit. Um, it's gonna be in Bloomington, and registration is still open, so we can send that out to individuals, or if you go to the ICSPS website, you can find that information. On January 20th, we're going to really dive into the Comprehensive Local Needs Assessment through a webinar, and that'll be at 10 a.m. on this. 20th of January. And then in February, we're going to explore who is in your CTE network and what that network looks like and who are those other partners that we'll briefly touch on today but really dive into in February. February 27th, we're going to look at examples of effective CTE networks. Who are some of our champions in the state that are doing that well? And then in March, as a pre-session to the Connections Conferences, we will be having a capstone event. There's going to be more information and registration for this event will be forthcoming. And this is also an opportunity if there are certain topics that we have covered in these webinars that you'd like to, us to dig a little deeper into, that's where we will be digging a little deeper and having a lovely face-to-face -face, um, training to capstone the Counselor Academy. Any questions there? So again, wanted to tell you this is a joint venture. We don't have ICCB on the line with us, but they are here. They are a sponsor of the CTE Counselor Academy, as well as the Illinois State Board of Education. And then this initiative is funded or um, funded at ISU and um, supported by the ICSPS, Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support. Some of you might be asking, who is ICSPS? And the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support creates, supports, delivers professional development for career, technical, and adult education professionals across Illinois. Um, we have been in existence since 1977, and um, we have been at Illinois State University that entire time. And we provide technical assistance, develop publications, and facilitate program improvement strategies for our partners as they relate to college transition, recruitment, retention, and completion, encouraging the achievement of special population learners. So our real focus is special populations and assisting high schools, districts, colleges, programs, in supporting special population learners and how we can assist those individuals to find success. So we're gonna start off with what is career and technical education? And we've all heard about CTE. CTE has been around for quite some time. Um, but really career and technical education provides students of all ages with academic and technical skills, knowledge and training necessary to succeed in future careers and to become lifelong learners. And this is one of the goals that we have several national organizations that support career technical education. And the idea is really to 
allow students to succeed. In total, about 12.5 million high school and college students are enrolled in career and technical education across the nation. CTE prepares these learners for the world of work by introducing them to workplace competencies and makes academic content accessible to students by providing it in a hands-on context. In fact, high school graduate graduation rates from CTE concentrators is about 90%, 15 percentage points higher than the national average. So career and technical education are those courses that are really hands-on courses. They are those that are outside of your academic core, so English, math, science, but there are components of each of those within career and technical education. And we're going to talk a little bit more about why C what CTE is. So a lovely brief history of career and technical education. And career and tech ed has been with us for quite some time. So in 1917, we had the Smith-Hughes Act. Um, it was the Smith Hughes National Vocational Education Act. And if you know anything about your educational history or you're, you wear that nerd hat like I do, it's very exciting because that was the first time that any public funding went to support education. So pretty exciting there. And then we continued to expand into the vocational educational amendments in 68. In 1984, we, the legislation really changed its name to the Carl D. Perkins Act. And that is because the gentleman, Carl Perkins, not the singer with blue suede shoes, but someone slightly different. And he was a representative from Kentucky and he advocated for the support of special populations. So we have funding starting in 1917, looking at industrial tech and at that time called home economics and then agriculture. And we've expanded that into different areas of career and technical education. We've moved from the language of vocational education over the years in the 60s and 70s into the 80s. It was still called vocational education. And then we really moved to the term vocational education is finally removed by the federal government in 2006 um, with the Career and Technical Education Act. The title Perkins has been kept throughout history with us since 84. It is affectionately known as Perkins today, but the law itself is the Strengthening Career and for the 21st Century Act. Um, it is affectionately known as Perkins because that is the term that has been associated with career and tech ed, but that's actually not in the title, fun fact there. And then um, we're really moving as career and technical education, not only as a program improvement law, but also an equity law. We do um, look at ways in which we can better serve our students through career and tech ed. It is one of the areas where we do come in and look for equitable um, opportunities for students and equitable distribution of resources for students as well. One mention of research I want to go into as we're talking about what is career and technical education is that about two years ago, the state of career and technical education um, was examined through the career advising and development lens. And we had new skills for youth, advanced CTE, the Council for Chief State School Officers, Educational Strategy Group, and the American School Counselors Association all looked at career advising and development as a whole and ways in which we could improve career advising and development. What the report found was that we need to provide more effective professional development and resources to school counselors. I'm not going to read all these to you. Um, we need to ensure that career advising and development is a school and community wide effort. We need to explore that partnership between secondary and post secondary. And how does that relationship work? We need to gather more data on existing strategies and implement new strategies when appropriate to really collaborate between secondary and post-secondary to best serve our students. And we need to examine and improve current career advising and development strategies so that they are part of the broad cohesive strategy and design to guide learners and effect effectively to careers of their choices. So in looking at that, I'm guessing that no one's terribly surprised that these are areas that the report has us focusing on. But at the same time, the reason why this is so important today is because all of these recommendations really shaped the Perkins 5 law. So this was two years ago. Perkins was reauthorized July 31st of 2018. And you see those, these trends, the effective professional development, ensuring that career advising and development in the school is there, partnership with post-secondary, and examining and improving career advising are all now part of that Perkins 5 legislation, which Heather will talk about in just a minute. I want to pause here for just a second and see if there's any questions. 
If you'd like to raise your hand or post anything in the question box, please feel free. Okay, seeing no questions, we're going to keep moving forward. I'm going to examine what a career pathway is, and many of you might have heard of the Career Pathway Dictionary. Um, the Career Pathway is defined by the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act as a combination of rigorous, high-quality educational trainings and other services, and then it does a, a slew of different things. It aligns with the skills, needs, and industry in the economy or of the state or region. It is really looking at that full range of secondary or post-secondary options within that career pathway, and it includes counseling to support an individual in achieving the individual's education and career goals. In addition, the career pathway definition provides insight into the ways in which we look at including as appropriate educational that education that is offered concurrently with the same context of the workforce preparation activities. Career pathways also accelerate the educational and career advancement. And then we're looking at career pathways that enable an individual to attain secondary school diploma or its recognized equivalent, at least as recognized post-secondary credential. And it helps individuals enter or advance through a specific occupational cluster. So this is the way in which Illinois has kind of envisioned the features of career pathways. And so you see we have, it is a well-connected, transparent educational training credential and support services. We have multiple entry points for both well-prepared students and targeted populations. And then we have multiple exit points. Career Pathway Programs, the three features of a quality Career Pathway Program is well-connected and transparent education training support services, multiple entry points that enable well-prepared students to be successful, and multiple extra exit points at successively higher levels. The four functions of a high-quality Career Pathway are participant-focused education and training, consistent and non-duplicative assessment of participants' education, and support services and career navigation assistance to facilitate transition. Again, roles there for career counselors. And then employment services with work experience. So I'm sure as you're, as we're walking through this, you're seeing different areas where the counseling role is not only essential, but embedded in the career post pathway program development. I wanted to share this because it really is a nice illustration of what is career and technical education. It fulfills our employment needs for high skill, high wage, and high demand careers. It has the whole gamut of career clusters, and those were intentionally designed to encapsulate anything that anyone would want to be when they grew up, and they have that expansion option within there. So information technology, again, these were developed back in the early 2000s, but that definition is different, but that, that cluster still does remain in check. Um, it prepares students for to be college and career ready, and then it talks about the encapsulation of core academic skills, employability skills, technical and job specific skills. So why is career and technical education so important and why is CTE really something that we should pay attention to? I want to <coughs> first acknowledge that career and technical education and STEM are very similar and career and technical education and STEM both are in the forefront of this conversation around what are some exciting opportunities for our students and sometimes STEM gets a little bit um, more press but career and technical education really does look at different ways in which we are supporting science technology engineering and mathematics so when we talk about why CTE we talk about that it can foster ingenuity and creativity and it can lead to new ideas and innovation. Without ingenuity and creativity, the recent development in artificial intelligences, digital learning would not be possible. These technologies were created by people who learned that if human mind can conceive it, the human mind can achieve it. And no doubt they had some great career and technical education teachers in their history. Career and technical education builds resistance. CTE activities being both hands-on and contextualized prepare students, allow students to learn 
in a safe environment and allows them to, to fall and try again. Career and technical education stresses the value of failure as a learning exercise, which enables students to embrace mistakes as part of the learning process. This allows students to build confidence and resilience, which enables them to keep going and get through those tough areas. After all, failure is part of the process that ultimately leads to success. Career and technical education also encourages experimentation. Without a little risk taking and experimentation, many of the technology advancements that have encouraged in the last couple of decades would not be possible. Many of the innovations that were created by people who were told that their ideas wouldn't work and their response was, let's try it and see. This type of attitude can be encouraged within career and technical education during the early years, which is now an opportunity within Perkins 5. It encourages teamwork. Teamwork can be taught to students' abilities at all levels, and students at varying levels of ability can work together in teams to find a solution to problems, record data, write reports, give presentations. The end result through career and technical education is that students who understand how to collaborate with others thrive in a teamwork-oriented environment. And we all know that the world of work is filled with team-oriented environments. It encourages knowledge of application. Again, we talked about how career and technical education is hands-on, but this motivates students to learn as they know that the skills that they are acquiring will be utilized immediately and in any way and in ways that positively impact them and their loved ones. The ability to apply their knowledge to new and novel tasks will bode well for them as they enter the workforce. Career and technical education also encourages the use of tech, which students encounter new technologies that will pair them to embrace instead of be hesitant or feel thrill of new technologies. It teaches problem solving, how to solve problems by using critical thinking skills and engaging in career and technical education learning experiences. Students learn how to examine problems and create a plan to solve them, and it encourages adaption. To succeed in life, students have to be able to apply what they have learned to a various situations and scenarios. And CTE encourages them to adapt concepts that they have learned in various interactions of problem issues. So there's a lot of benefits to career and tech ed. We talked a lot about, it, about employability and how all of these things that career and tech ed does really supports essential employability. And so one of the things that I want to highlight now is the essential employability skills framework, which is a um, document that has been created um, coming out of the Workforce Education Strategic Plan from the state of Illinois. And what it says is that as a curriculum, we are focusing on work ethic, personal ethic, and communication and teamwork. And there's a lot of areas within your institution and within your curriculum, and within our CTE teachers that we're highlighting these I ideas. And so this, this is a tool to assist our faculty and our administration in looking at how to highlight essential employability skills. So kind of to wrap up here, why CTE? Career and technical education provides real world experiences, specific skills for students, and some students who have already earned a four year degree enroll back in career and technical education programs to help them change their careers or move into new careers. There are many technical education um, careers that pay more than the national mean and offer benefits and retirement packages. And some fun stats on um, why CTE. The Department of Labor lists occupations through training or associate's degree offer a median annual salary range from 40 to 77,000. And STEM, education's again, easily paired with CTE, pay a large role in career planning and then um, the best paying degrees for graduates earning bachelor's degree in 2015 was engineering, 62,000, computer science, 61,287, um, and healthcare, which is 50,839. Not far behind um, other degrees. I'm going to pause now again for questions. See if anybody needs to raise their hand. There are not any questions. I'm going to go ahead and hand the floor over to Heather. And Heather's going to walk us through counselor and advisor and CT career and technical education. Thanks, Amy. 
Good morning, everyone. I didn't um, properly uh, indicate what my role was at Illinois State Board of Education, so I wanted to do that now. Prior to um, working there, I work in the CTE and Innovation Department, and prior to working there, um, I was a school counselor for, oh, 15 years for middle school and high school. So I was very anxious and excited to sit in on this process of creating a Counselor Academy specifically for school counselors, post-secondary advisors uh, across the state. So I'm going to dive in now a little bit on um, what it looks like with our role, counselor's role, advisor's role within career and technical education. And you'll hear me telling Amy <laughs> to go to the next slide as she has control. So go ahead, Amy. <laughs> So from a study that was done in 2016, these were the um, highlights of or the recommended uh, roles that school counselors have within career and technical education. And I wholeheartedly agree with these. Advocating for CTE is a, a crucial component. Obviously, we need to have an understanding of what CTE is and how that it impacts our students. But advocating for CTE is top of the list. Explaining the curricular requirements you heard Amy talk about pathways. There's also programs of study that I'll be alluding to within the Perkins Five um, terminology for CTE, where a student follows a specific um, course work that allows them to be what we call a concentrator, saying that they're concentrating within a certain pathway within CTE. So it's, um, when we sit down and, and counsel our students on the classes that they're going to take the next year, understanding what those curricular requirements are in order for them to find that pathway, uh, finish that program of study in CTE is very important. That goes right along with the next bullet point of facilitating consideration of the options, knowing that CTE and those coursework pathways are relevant to every student within the school. Um, there is a pathway for every career, so um, it really is saying that we need to expand um, the understanding for our students and for the parents to be able to explain ex exactly what CT is and how that works when they're considering their options for post-secondary. Again, going right to the next one, assisting with post-secondary employment search and selection process. We know we have those perhaps exit interviews where we're talking with our seniors, where we're getting them ready for post-secondary, or getting them ready for job placement. So it's uh, important for them to, for us as, as counselors, to aid in that. And then also with the career development needs as well. So those are all just a big picture ideas of what our role as counselors are. Go ahead. So when we talk about the advocating for CTE, which is, as I said, I, I feel is, is one of the, the main goals, I think this visual really helps with providing some information on, okay, messaging. What's this going to look like when we're having these conversations with parents, with students, even with community members and, and industry? And we'll get into that a little bit more. But this graphic, I think, really um, offers that just, just a very clear-cut messaging that you could promote within your school. So you have the real options uh, for college and rewarding careers, the real-world skills, and the high school experiences with more value. Okay. So there was a study that Advanced CTE did uh, in 2017 where they actually tested several messages for parents and students on um, basically how to advocate or promote CTE. And these are the, this is the finding of, of these messages. And if you look at the concepts, those were the, the ones that were most successful across the board for dealing with discussions with parents and students on what CTE is and what the benefits are for CTE. And so you can see preparing for the real world is there, getting more from high school. And they actually have specific statements um, within the what works in the key language, information that we need to know as counselors so that we can then um, promote that and explain those different components to everyone that's a stakeholder within CTE. When you have those conversations um, regarding what post-secondary placement is going to look like, what they're going to do, why should I take this class? Is it is it worth it to be in this or take that? These are the messaging um, that they found to be the most effective. 
Um, and at the secondary level, you're looking at, at K through 12, talking to the parents regarding this. And at post-secondary, you're talking to the students, but yet still having these types of conversations, although with limited, as far as coursework and grades and so forth with the parents, you're still having these conversations um, to ensure that everyone understands the relevance and the significance of CTE. Okay. And then this is just a, a nice graphic that you could include as well. So we're taking basically those concepts from the previous slide and we're putting it into statistics that give it a little more oomph, so to speak, when you're having these conversations. So you can create these flyers, find more information. There is a link there within on the, on the one slide or on the one picture. Um, that basically is just an overview for how this can work for parents and for students with the 92% um, satisfied with our high school experience compared to 78% of those not involved in CTE. So you can read those statistics, but that's just, I just wanna kind of get a, an introduction to ways that we can help promote CTE uh, across the board for, as I said, for parents, for students, for ourselves <laughs> to be able to have this knowledge and then also um, at the post-secondary level to, to show how this links across, across the board. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about uh, different connections here. Um, so first and foremost, you're going to have as, as a counselor, those connections to, to teachers, to faculty within your schools, within your university colleges and so forth. So your role then as a counselor is to serve as a resource person. So you could be the go-to person, so to speak, when it comes to classroom teachers needing assistance with career development um, experiences for their students, if they need um, information regarding um, up and coming programs that are available. You can have those meetings with those faculty members and teachers um, and, and the CTE instructors so that you're all on the same page. So you're building those relationships and, and helping each other promote what CTE is and what that looks like within your school. The workshops that they, reference for the second thing along the same lines that can be for both students or for staff so if your CTE teachers or faculty members classroom teachers are coming to you regarding something that maybe is relevant across across um, multiple disciplines then you would be able to provide these workshops for them and then also meeting with the school and district personnel so that you have a clear picture um, of what CTE looks like within the schools and you can be that support to provide them resources, um, and so forth. Okay. Business and industry. This is a big one. Um, this is one I will admittedly um, say that it, I think can be seen as a bit of a, of a struggle for counselors to, to reach out and, and determine how we're gonna get business and industry involved and with those connections. So I think this is a good list. Um, as a starting point, we're actually going to dig into this a lot deeper with a capstone event. Um, but I think this is just to, to kind of get us started, to get you thinking about what this looks like, especially when we uh, also when we talk about the CTE network and what that looks like across across your area. So working relationships with local partners, making those phone calls to some of the industry partners that you have within your area the new programs that you can develop based on those needs. So when you have those, um, I think when the next one talks about advisory committees. So when you're having those conversations, you can then talk with the CTE teachers or whoever it needs to be to say, perhaps we need to develop a program to meet the needs of what our community needs. Community-based organizations sitting in at the Chamber of Commerce going to um, a couple of those meetings, having those connections so that you are aware of what is going on within your community is very important. Maintaining the commitment for work-based learning opportunities, that's a direct link to business and industry so that students are working within your community um, through the use of the paid or there's an unpaid community placement with that. And then supporting the school to career goals by creating all of these business partnerships that we just discussed, job shadowing then would be an option or internships or mentoring, career speakers, employment, but getting the business and industry into the schools so that it becomes a partnership, I think is, is very crucial. And, and the school counselor can play 
an important role in, in being that advocate for that and in developing and maintaining those relationships. Okay. Student connection. This one, there's a lot. <laughs> and I'm not going to go into uh, great detail because these are things we're doing all the time now anyway. But when we take a look at it from a CTE lens, so the first first thing is career advising. And when I go into a little bit more about Perkins 5, you'll see that career advising and, and career exploration is, is really a high point for, for the Perkins legislation, where we are talking about providing the career guidance to students um, with individual or group settings. Um, so, and you can be the, the resource again for the students, for the educational planning and your, and your career and life skills decisions and so forth. Um, programs of study, we talked about that. Programs of study or pathways uh, are, are one way to look at it, but basically that sequencing of courses that would allow a student, and granted, they probably are going to change their mind as to what they want to do, but at least showing them uh, a, a pathway that will allow them to meet that post-secondary goal that they have. And right along with that then is course enrollment. So when you're having those conversations with them, um, your perhaps your registration guides that you have could in include a CTE component within that that has those pathways or programs of study that can show the students what courses they need to be in enrolled in and how to make that link between what's required for state requirements and then also what can be enhanced then with the CTE and what's relevant for that student. Supporting career and technical student organizations, our CTSOs, those are usually linked to a certain area within um, those pathways, and that also plays into the employability skills and also leadership skills that Amy has mentioned, um, and encouraging the students to be enrolled in them, involved in them, not enrolled, involved in them. The scholarships and post-secondary requirements, again, you're having those conversations with them, what that looks like for a CTE student, um, what, what's available for them. Post-secondary plans, again, where is this going to lead? What are we looking at here as far as this, this pathway that you're involved in? Encouraging the work-based learning and cooperative education. What a better way for them to have hands-on experience, including the apprenticeships, hands-on experience for um, determining whether or not that's the career that they want to choose. And I have found that once they hit that junior, senior year, um, that's what they're looking for. They really want to expand their um, outlook, so to speak, on what the potential is for, for me once I've graduated. So they're looking at um, getting, getting that hands-on experience, being able to be in the workplace. You're strengthening their employability skills. You're strengthening their academic skills. All those components fit in there. So those connections and showing the students the opportunities that they have within that is, is crucial. And then apprenticeships as well. Uh, explaining to them that, that that's an option. There's youth apprenticeships now where they can, that can be going on while they're in school um, and then leading to an apprenticeship once they've graduated from school. Those are all important connections with our students. So before I dive into Perkins 5, <laughs> I'll stop as well and see if there are any questions or clarifications or anything that anyone would like to share regarding what we've discussed so far. Please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to speak or post a question in the question box. Okay, I think we'll move on then. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit now about Perkins 5 and what, and what that looks like for counselors. So the most simplistic way to tell you what Perkins is, is Perkins is dedicated to increasing learner access to high quality CTE programs of study. There's a focus on um, system alignment and program involvement, and the law has been critical to ensure that the programs are meeting the needs of the learners, but also employers. So it is an overall strengthening the quality of CTE programs and increasing access for all of our students. Okay. So I'm going to throw a little bit of statistics at you. I didn't type it all out. So who benefits from Perkins? Learners, employers, and communities. 
As far as learners, there are approximately 8 million secondary learners and 4 million post-secondary learners that are enrolled in CTE programs nationwide. Employers, 60% of companies report that they have difficulty finding uh, or filling job openings because of a lack of qualified applicants. CTE programs, therefore, are very responsive to current and emerging labor market demands where we're building those relationships, as I mentioned, with industry. Um, and, and so when those companies are having difficulty finding um, those jobs, qualified job applicants, it can cost them upward of $800,000 each year in lost productivity and recruitment. So that then trickles down to the communities and saying that the benefits from Perkins is a community with a skilled workforce leads to a strong economy. So those are just some of the, the benefits. There's, there's more, but the overarching benefits from the, the legislation that goes into Perkins 5 and how it helps. So within funding, there are specific um, requirements, or, or not even just requirements, but there are specific um, areas that Perkins allows for funding. And so I've listed them here, professional development and technical assistance, professional development that includes counselors, advisors, uh, creation of new innovative programs of study. We've, we've hit on that a little bit as far as creating new um, programs of study that perhaps you need within your area to meet the demands of, of your industry needs. Supporting implementation and continuous improvement of the programs of study that you already have in place. How, how can we increase those work-based learning experiences for those students? How, how can we offer them more career ex exploration within those areas? Okay. Data collection and analysis, including programs and plan evaluation and monitoring. And we're going to talk about that a little bit with the uh, comprehensive local needs assessment. So we're going to look at um, what our role within that. We have a whole webinar ded dedicated to that, but I will briefly touch on that in, in a few slides from now. And then career exploration guidance and advisement. I think that's probably the biggest one that, that tends to fall um, whenever they hear that, when we hear that word, that that's going to fall on the counselor or, or advisor's role. Um, and it certainly does play a part within this, um, but it is also it also needs to be looked at as across the board, even within the classes themselves, and how we can be that support and resource for the career exploration. Okay. So where do counselors fit in? And like I said, we're gonna look at the, the local needs assessment, special populations, um, resources for programs of study, and a little bit on faculty. Um, okay, but we're, I think we're gonna hit the needs assessment now. So one of the requirements for the Perkins 5 um, legislation is a comprehensive local needs assessment that has to occur every two years. And there have been some trainings so far on this and, and upcoming trainings actually on what we call just the local needs assessment. So it's a, a needs assessment that occurs at the local level. But within the comprehensive local needs assessment, these are the areas that are required for schools, school districts, uh, regional um, region EFEs to report on, on, on what, they're, what they're looking at, what their needs are. So student performance indicators, including the performance of special populations and subgroups. And within CTE, we have what is known as concentrators. So a student who has taken specific levels of classes within a certain area is considered a concentrator. So we're looking at the performance indicators of these concentrators to see how they stack up across the state across um, compared to those who are not in CTE and if they're hitting the mark and when we talk about performance indicators it would be things like the um, SAT um, academic you know for English and for and for math and so forth so there's various indicators we'll get in more to that I would strongly encourage you to listen in on the next webinar regarding um, the no local, local needs assessment but here's a perfect example of, of a counselor's role within that knowing that there's an academic component to to what our three structures are um three circles so to speak for guidance within our students for our students so performance indicators um with the academic component would be something where we would 
we would be able to provide input on, on what that's looking like for our students. The next is whether or not the programs are sufficient in size, scope, and quality to meet the needs of all of our, all of our students whether or not they're meeting the labor market needs, again, encouraging that business and industry connection, and recruitment and retention and training of CTE professionals, teachers, paraprofessionals, um, academic counselors, uh, guidance counselors, and so forth. And then progress towards implementation of equal access, again, to high quality CTE courses and programs of study, of, that should be a study for all students. Okay. So within the Perkins Five, there is uh, career exploration and career guidance activities that are specified. Um, each, in fact, each local application must contain a description of how that eligible recipient is going to provide the career guidance and academic counseling to students before enrolling and while enrolled in participating in career and technical education. And in fact, there's an intentional intentional emphasis on career guidance and advisement starting in middle school as a way to support potential and current CTE students. And Perkins 5 also expands on the definition of CTE to potentially include career exploration beginning, as I said, in the middle grades. And they, there's a specific section, section 134B, which states, just as I've said here, that we have to provide um, an organized system of career guidance and academic counseling. Section 122 states that the state plan shall include the state strategic vision and set of goals for preparing an educated and skilled workforce. Along with Perkins 5, we have the CTEI, which is Career Technical Education Improvement Grant, which is a state matched, it's state matched to the Perkins Federal Grant. And the proposed allowable uses of funds, which we had just talked about, is almost identical, um, except the state dollars can actually take this career guidance exploration um, down to the kindergarten level for career exploration. Um, Post-secondary also has a state grant that um, provides student support, funding for student support along these same lines. So there's a big emphasis within Perkins 5 for this career exploration and career guidance, as well as um, special population, which I believe is what Amy is going to talk about next. Yes, thank you, Heather. So there are some changes within Perkins 5 around special populations. And we just really, for the first time since 1984, expanded that definition, which is pretty exciting. So when you're looking at special populations, they include individuals with disabilities, both cognitive and physical. So we do and should have a great partnership with our special education um, individuals at our institutions because they will support us as we're working to have these students in our career and technical education classrooms. In addition, we're looking at individuals that come from economically disadvantaged families, including low income youth and adults. That has been a special population for the whole since 84. This year, there is a um, re-emphasis and kind of a refocus on individuals preparing for non-traditional fields. This is still a core indicator, so this is something that's tied to your numbers, which then, in fact, is tied to um, funding availability for the state. So this, for Illinois, is a, is a big deal, which is why our next session for the CTE Counselor Academy is focused on NTO. We're bringing in the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity, and we're going to look at what are those issues that NTO students could face, what are those strategies to really help our students who are pursuing non-traditional occupations. So men going into child care, women going into um, the trades, men going into nursing, women going into IT. What are those things that we can do at the institutional level, at the local level, at the teacher level, at the counselor level that will support our students in being successful in those areas? In addition, Special populations include single parents, including pregnant and parenting teens, out-of-work individuals, English learners, homeless individuals. This one is new. Um, so homeless individuals were somebody who was there before. And I'm sorry, home homeless individuals is new to um, CTE. And then um, displaced homemakers was a special population that was there before. And now we're looking at 
that finally updating to out-of-work individuals to align with the WIOA legislation. Number eight there is new as well. Youth who are in or have aged out of the foster care system. And then in addition to that, we have youth with a parent who is a member of the armed forces and is on active duty. So the special populations are really those students who can receive some additional support at both the secondary and post-secondary level. And um, that's really a nice role where the counselors can, again, have, have a role in the implementation of Perkins. So I wanted to provide you with some resources, and these are all resources that were shared with the National Counselors Association um, by Advanced CTE, and also resources that we found in, in preparing for this webinar. So as I said, the webinar will be made available, as well as the recording, and you'll be able to access and click these links. I want to now open up the floor and ask if there are any questions. Why you are typing up those questions and looking um, at that, I want to just take a minute and walk through one more time what the Counselor Academy is going to include and what we've prepared for you. So again, today is the overview of career and technical education in Perkins. Um, December 2nd, we'll be convening in Bloomington, um, lovely middle of the state there for the Non-Traditional Fields or NTO Summit with the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity. It'll be an engaging day. It'll be a dynamic day. Um, we start around 9, we're ending around 3.30, so it, it is a full day of professional development around NTO. January 20th, we're going to come together again on this webinar platform looking at comprehensive local needs assessment. February 13th, we're going to come back right before Valentine's Day and talk about who is in your CTE network. And so we can look at what that network looks like and who are those partners that, again, we've kind of shared a little bit about this, but this was just really a taste for some of the other exciting conversations that we'll have as we move forward. And then on February 27th, we'll come together with examples of effective CTE networks. Our final capstone event will be hosted in coordination with the pre-conference as a pre-conference uh, for the Regional Connection Conferences. And um, once we get the dates for that, we will share that out immediately. Um, we're just still waiting on some I's to be dotted and T's to be crossed prior to um, being able to share when Connections is and um, what that information is. So if you have any questions, I don't see any questions posting up at this time. I'm going to share our information again and um, thank you all for your time. I hope you have a lovely day and have a happy Thanksgiving. Heather, do you have any closing comments? No, I do not. Just thanks everyone for listening in and attending. Great, thank you everyone, have a lovely day.